It's no secret that Unity developers all around the world are currently facing a huge amount of uncertainty since Unity announced its new pricing structure a few days ago. I made a video where I shared my thoughts on that which I'll leave a link to so you can check it out. But I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything I could to help ease the transition for many game developers who are currently looking to move away from Unity and towards a different engine. I put out a poll on my YouTube community tab and asked which engine people would like to see a transition video for and the response was overwhelmingly in favour of Godot. So in this video, I'm going to cover as best I can the fundamental differences between Unity and Godot and how certain concepts such as game objects, components, events and more translate over to the Godot engine. I really hope you guys find this video helpful and if there's anything you feel I've missed or would like more clarification on, I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know that I have now opened up the ability for you to become a Code with Tom member here on YouTube. Members will get exclusive access to a private Q&A section over on my Discord where I'll answer all your questions directly, as well as getting access to source code for projects and assets I work on for the channel in the future. I'll let you know a little bit more about what's coming next at the end of the video, so stick around to hear more. So to get started, I'm going to go over to godotengine.org and download the latest version of Godot. As of the time of this recording, this is 4.1.1. So let's download that there. And I'm going to save this to my downloads folder. And I've actually already downloaded a copy of this. So let me quickly open that up. And you'll see here we now have the Godot application. I'm going to cancel this download here. And I'm just going to drag this Godot application into my applications folder. It's going to say, do I want to replace it? Because I already have a copy. I'm going to say yes. And now we can open the Godot application. It's going to say, are you sure you want to open this? I am. All right, so this is the Godot project manager. Now this is kind of similar to the Unity Hub, except this is for a very specific version of Godot. For example, here you can see it says V4.1.1. Now in Unity Hub, you have the ability to download individual versions of Unity and then open your projects in a very specific version via a dropdown. Here, we don't have that ability. If you wanted to download or, or open a project in a different version of Godot, you would have to specifically go back to the Godot website and download that very specific version. So in this example here, we're on 411, and here we have our local projects. Now, you would probably just see a blank screen here if this is the first time you're using it. I obviously have a couple of projects that have been on this machine before. And we also have the ability to browse the asset library projects. This is kind of similar to the Unity Asset Store. It's just it's a little less full featured. It doesn't have the ability to buy assets right now. They are working on improvements to the asset store for Godot. But currently we have things like, for example, the Kenny uh, 3D platformer starter kit here. So if you were to click on this, for example, you could create a brand new Godot project using that starter kit. Now there are templates, there are examples and various other things in here. Feel free to have a, you know, a browse through this. For example, we have a, an inventory system here. But basically, whenever you create a project via this asset library project, you will get a whole project that can be opened up. So it's a little a little dissimilar to how Unity Asset Store works there in that you can download packages and import them to your uh, Unity project, that your pre-existing Unity project. This is a little bit more um, gung-ho, if you like. So anyway, I'm going to come back to my local projects and I'm going to click on New Project. Here, I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it Unity to Godot. And I'm going to press Create Folder. And what this is going to do is going to create the right path for me, wherever my project path was in this instance, just my home directory. The next thing we get to choose is our renderer. We've got three options. We've got the Forward Plus, we've got Mobile, and Compatibility. They pretty much do what it says on the tin. Forward Renderer is for desktop platforms only. Mobile is for desktop and mobile. And Compatibility just lets you create something that can be run on many, many different kinds of lower or older devices, lower end or older devices, I should say. Uh, we're going to stick with forward renderer here. Now, you might notice that we didn't get the choice of 2D or 3D. I'll show you how that works shortly. But basically, you just choose your renderer based on what kind of platform you want to target here. You also get an option to choose your version control metadata system. I think it's just non or git. Yeah, it is. It's non or git. So we're going to choose git. And that basically just means that all of the metadata files that are generated are going to be compatible with your version control system. Now we are going to press create and edit, and this is going to spin up the Godot engine for us. 
And this is the Godot editor. So you should be relatively familiar with this coming from Unity because it's it's laid out in a very, very similar way. Um, you'll notice the the immediate difference here is that the viewport into the game is the you know front and front and center focus here you've got a very very large area for you to pan around in the controls are very similar right click hold right click and use wasp to move around middle mouse button to pan and uh, sorry to rotate around the camera and yeah you've, you've you know you've got all the similar controls there that you'll be used to in unity to access um you know to move around your 3d scene now on the left hand side here we have our scene tab now this is basically your Unity hierarchy window. Um, it doesn't look the same right now because it's asking us to choose a root node. And this goes back to what I was saying before about you didn't get the choice to choose between 2D and 3D when you first created the project. You can actually come in and choose on a scene by scene basis whether you want this scene to be a 2D scene, a 3D scene, uh, just a piece of user interface or any other thing that you can imagine. Um, I'll dive into this a little bit later, but basically, in Godot, everything is a um, everything is a scene. Um, so we'll kind of we'll understand that a little bit better as I dive into things here. Um, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to press 3D scene, and this is going to add a root node to our scene. Now, as I mentioned here, everything is a node, and nodes are they they basically create your hierarchy. So how it's called hierarchy in Unity you're effectively creating the same thing here. This is our, our root game object, if you like. So I'm going to call this world just because that's a convention that I'm used to. But it's a physical object in the world. It has a position, a rotation, and this just gives us something to hang all of our other objects, nodes um, off of, basically. So before I dive into anything else with nodes, I want to come straight down to the file system tab. This is effectively your project tab in Unity. This is where you'll find all of the files and resources, materials, textures, you know, 3D models, scripts, anything that you create within your project, that's going to live here in the file system. Then, of course, we have the large viewport. I've already gone over the controls for this, but you have tools up here, such as the select tool, the move tool, the rotate tool, and the scale tool, and a bunch of other things here that configure, you know, how you want the scene to, to look, and you can do various other things, such as, you know, setting the preview sun or, you know, changing a bunch of different things here, how it's, how it's laid out. You can have multiple viewports if you want to set it up that way. Um, but basically, this is your scene view in Unity, except here we, we just call it the, um, the viewport. So over on the right hand side here, this is almost exactly the same as Unity. You have your inspector panel. Now, if I choose our world node over here, you'll see that it's selected at the top here. We've got our world node. And then underneath this, we can modify all of the properties that are relevant to this specific node. So for example, I could change its position on the x-axis, I can change its rotation, although you won't see that because I'm not on the rotate tool. Um, but yeah, you can change basically all of the properties that are very specific to this node. Now where this differs, and this, this is a kind of a philosophical change from Unity, is that you don't come in here to add components. So you might be thinking, well, you know, how would I add a, for example, a rigid body um, or a collider or you know any other sort of component to a node. Well, again, this is how Godot differs. What we would do here is we would create separate nodes that live underneath um, another one. So it's kind of like composing nodes together to create whatever you want. So let me give you a demonstration of that. I want to create a um, just a flat box that lives in the scene and then I want to create some some spheres that can can fall down and use physics to to bounce on that um, on that floor so to do that what I'm going to do is click on this little plus symbol here in our scene you can also right click um, on the actual world node itself I'm going to click here and I'm going to add a new node to our scene now to add a box unlike unity where you would right click and press create cube we're going to have to create a mesh instance 3d node so I'm going to rename this one just for clarity. I'm going to double click in here, or you can also click and press enter. And I'm going to call this cube. Now you'll see this 
is a completely empty node. There's nothing there right now. If I press F, which is uh, the same key as in Unity to focus on your current um, your current target, you can see there's literally nothing in the scene. Um, that's that's not actually a cube at all. This is just a representation that we have a mesh instance here. So. To actually turn this into a cube, I need to come over to the inspector and change the mesh property of the mesh instance 3D. I'm going to click this little drop down here and I'm going to choose a box mesh. And you can see here now that we have a box in our scene. Now, if I were to press play here, it's going to ask me if I want to um, use the current scene to, to play the game with. I'm going to say yes, select current, and it's going to ask me to save it before we continue. That's fine. Now, you can see here, I can't see anything in this view right now. That's because one, we don't have a camera, and two, I haven't positioned it to be able to look at the box. So what we can do is I can press the stop button at the top right here, and let's come in and add a camera to the scene. I'm gonna right click, add child node, and I'm gonna type in camera 3D. And here we get very, very similar controls that we would expect in uh, Unity. You know, we've got this sort of example camera here, and I'm gonna just position this. Let's say we position it there, and then I'm gonna rotate it so it's looking down at our cube slightly. And we can also press this preview button up here to see exactly what it looks like. Um, looks like I have shifted it off axis slightly. There we go, let's preview it again. Okay, so now if I press the play button, you'll see that we can see our cube. Obviously I haven't added any lighting to the scene yet, but it's not doing anything. So what I wanted was I wanted a sphere that could fall onto a floor. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna change this cube here. I'm gonna come, come up to the cube and I'm gonna click on the actual um, box image here. And this is gonna allow me to modify the properties of that specific mesh. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna change its X and its Z value to 10, just to give us this nice sort of floor here. And then just so that we can see what's going on, I'm also gonna add a directional light to the scene, just by choosing the directional light 3D here. And let's position this uh, let's see, let's try that. Let's just see what that looks like in the game. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a, um, I'm gonna create a rigid body. Now, normally in Unity, what you would do is you would go, you know, create sphere, and then you would add a rigid body component to that sphere. Well, it, it works a little differently here. We're gonna add child node, and we're gonna choose a rigid body 3D. And this is gonna to complain to me. You can see Godot gives you these helpful little warnings that if you mouse over them, like so, it'll tell you, you know, this node doesn't have a shape, it can't collide with anything, and it will tell you what it's missing. So it's telling us it needs a collision shape. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm first of all gonna move this up a little bit just so that we can see, um, see where it is. And then underneath this rigid body 3D, I'm gonna give it its mesh. So I'm gonna add a mesh instance. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna choose a sphere mesh. And you can see here now that we have a sphere. Now it's still telling me it doesn't have a collider. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on the rigid body 3D again. And this is where I say that everything is a node here. You, you're basically composing a hierarchy of nodes to create whatever object you, you can imagine. So for example, in Unity, um, this would be a game object. It would have a rigid body 3D component. It would have a mesh renderer component, and it would also have a um, you know a sphere collider component. However, this is this is working kind of differently in that we have our rigid body 3D as our root node, and then we're adding everything else under it. So we're adding our, our um, you know the visible component, which is the mesh instance, and now we're going to add the collider, which is a collision shape 3D, and this is going to need to take a shape over in the inspector here, and I'm gonna choose a sphere. Now you can see here, if I zoom in, you can see here that if I reset that, you kind of get this little outline appear when you choose sphere shape 3D. It just so happens that it matches up with the, with the size of the mesh instance sphere because we've left them both at the default size, the default radius of 0.5M. Um, so if I now press the play button, what's gonna happen is this ball is gonna fall because it's a rigid body, so it's impacted by gravity, but it's gonna fall straight through the cube that we added before. The reason it did that is because the cube we added before was simply a mesh instance. It's just a visible mesh within the scene. It has no physics attached to it. In order to have physics collisions, we would actually have to make it a either a rigid body 3D or we could make it a static body 3D. Now I'm gonna choose static body because I don't actually want the floor 
to be impacted by, um, by gravity. So let's drag our cube underneath the static body 3D. And then let's add our collision shape 3D here. I'm going to choose a box shape. And I'm going to have to come into the box shape here and change its size to 10 on the X and 10 on the Z just to match up with the, with the size here. And you can see now that our collision shape has surrounded the, the mesh instance. So if I press the play button now, we're going to see that that sphere is going to land on this box. Now, what I would like to do is I would like to make the um, I'd like to make the sphere, which is this one in this case. So let's rename that to sphere and let's rename this one to ground. I'd like to make the sphere um, bounce whenever it hits the ground. Now, you would do that as part of the rigid body um, material in Unity. In Godot, we come over to the rigid body 3D settings and we can set here, we, you can see if I expand this a little, we have a physics material override. So I'm gonna click on this and press new physics material. I'm gonna click on the physics material itself to access its properties. And I'm gonna add just a little bit of bounce here, let's say 0.5. And let's see what happens if I press play now. All right, so now we have a bouncy sphere. What I'd like to do now is I would like to turn this sphere into something that we can reuse and, and dot about our scene multiple times without having to make changes. This in Unity, of course, is called a prefab. In Godot, it's, it's actually referred to as a scene. Almost everything in Godot is a scene comprised of nodes. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this entire sphere object here into its own individual scene. I'm going to right click on it and press Save Branch as Scene. It's going to ask me where I want to save the file. I'm going to call it sphere.tscn. So this is your equivalent of creating a, you know, dragging a um, game object from the hierarchy into your project and creating a prefab in Unity. We're doing the same thing here. We're basically creating a prefab. Um, so I'm going to call this sphere.tscn. And now you can see that the, um, the mesh instance and the collision have disappeared from our scene hierarchy here. They're actually hidden because uh, you can see here we've got this little open in editor. They're actually now part of this sphere scene, which is a completely separate scene. Um, you know, you can instantiate this just like you would a prefab in uh, in Unity. But here we can now drag this into our scene from the from the file system. Again, exactly the same as you can with prefabs in Unity. And just to show you that they are all the same scene, I'm going to go into the scene or the um, you know, the, the prefab, as you would call it in Unity, I'm going to open an editor and I'm going to come over to, um, let's say, what do we want to change here? Let's change our mesh instance and let's click on the ball, the sphere, and I'm going to give it a new material. I'm going to change its material here. I'm going to call it, I'm going to give it a standard material 3D and let's change the albedo color to, I don't know, let's change it to this color here. And now if I come back to my world scene, you can see that all of them have changed. So this is exactly um, exactly how you would have prefabs. You can have, of course, nested scenes within scenes, um, which gives you the, the nested prefab ability um, from Unity. But if I drag all of these up, let's say, let's grab these three here, let's drag them up, just to prove that um, you know they're all inheriting the same physics properties. Let's see, where are we? This one over here, let's just drag this over. And then we'll press play. And you can see now that all of them are fallen and bouncing, just as we would expect. What I'd like to show you now is how you can add environments um, such as a sky and you know post-processing effects to a Godot scene. To do that, I'm gonna select our camera 3D object. And let's first of all, just rotate it ever so slightly so that we can see the horizon a little bit better. I'm gonna move it back as well. Let's just double check the preview on this. Okay, that looks good. And I'm gonna come into, on our inspector panel here, I'm gonna come up to environment and choose new environment. And then I'm gonna click on the environment there. And this is gonna give us kind of the things that you would see on a camera component in uh, Unity, where you would be able to set like the clear color of the camera. Um, in this instance, I'm gonna choose, well, let's just say for starters, we can choose a custom color and let's choose something like this and press play and I'll show you how that impacts things. So obviously now that has changed the, the entire clear color for that camera. But if I want to add a sky, for example, I can choose sky and then we get this new option here and you can choose what kind of sky you want. So I'm gonna press new sky and choose a procedural sky material. 
And this then gives us further options to customize what color we want. Let's say we want it to be a little brighter and maybe the horizon color. Let's go for this nice. Yeah, let's let's choose that one. And then let's press play. And now you can see that that has completely changed um, the background, the background color for our um, for our sky. Now, this is also impacted by the directional light. So if I come over to the directional light here and let's just move it up just so that we can see where the arrow is pointing. Let's make the arrow point the, the camera and this should allow us to see the sun in the sky. There we go. So you can tweak that to your heart's content. You can change all of these colors so that it's appropriate for your game. But that's just one thing I wanted to show you um, with regards to how you set up the camera's environment. The other thing we can do here, if I just minimize this, is we can create a attributes. Um, we're going to give it a, let's say, camera attributes physical. Now, these the two different things here give you different options. The physical one lets you change the frost room and exposure settings. We can turn on auto exposure, for example, to give you that sort of Unreal Engine um, auto exposure as you're walking in and out of scenes, depending on what the lighting is. I'm actually going to change this to a camera attributes practical. And what I'd like to show you is how we can add things such as depth of field. See here we have this depth of field blur option. I'm going to enable the far option and I'm going to change it to Let's just change it to something like 0.5. Let's press play. Yeah, and you can see everything is completely blurry here. So let's try and change that to, I don't know, two. Just to see if we can get that sort of depth of field going on. In fact, we probably need it to be a little bit further away. You, you get the point anyway. Basically, the further away from the camera you are, the um, the blurrier this will get. So yeah, that's that's one way you can add um, sort of post-processing effects and environment details. You've got a bunch of other things inside environments such as fog and glow and tone mapping and all that sort of stuff. Things that you would find in um, post-processing effects stack within Unity. Now let's say I wanted to add some UI to this scene. Well, I can come up to our world node here. Let's add a new child node. And what I'm going to add is a uh, control. Let's add this to our scene. And you can see that it immediately flipped me to the 2D view. If you hadn't already noticed at the top here, we have 2D, 3D script and asset library. It's immediately flipped me to the 2D view so that I can modify um, the, the UI components of this particular node. At the top panel here, you can see that we have this little cross in a circle icon. This allows us to change the anchor for this particular node. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the stretch or the full rect option here. And that's going to make sure that this particular control node takes up the entire screen on, on the game window. And then underneath this, I'm going to add a label node. And all I want to do here is I want to give it a value. Let's say, hello, Godot. And let's stretch this. Let's say we want to stretch it across the center of the screen. In the inspector here, I'm going to change the horizontal alignment to center. And let's say we want to give it some label settings. Let's change the label settings here to, I don't know, let's give it a font size of 64. And let's maybe give it an outline of five pixels and black. And now if I press the play button here, you can see that we have a UI element uh, over the top of our game. We can add all sorts of things here, such as buttons or scroll recs. There's a, um, let me see here, let's a horizontal, I think it's called HBox. There we go, HBox container. There's a bunch of different containers and, and various things you can use here to make up your UI. And I'll dive into some of this in a later video, but this is just to show you that to add UI components to your game, you want to have a root node, which is a control. And then you want to come up to the 2D view here so that you can actually see what's going on. You'll see that if I flip to the 3D view, unlike Unity, where Unity smashes the, you know, the UI elements right into your 3D scene, and sometimes it can be a real nightmare, um, this just, it doesn't do that. It gives you a nice clean separation between your 3D and your 2D which is fantastic in my opinion. So what if I want to add a script to a object? To do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come into my sphere scene here. I'm gonna right click on this sphere and press attach script. This is gonna ask me, you know, what language do I want to use? I only have the GD script version of Godot installed here, but if you had the C sharp mono version, you would get the option of GD script or C sharp. 
it's going to ask me what um, component, what node I'm going to inherit from. This is kind of like your mono behavior inheritance, except you know in Unity, all game objects inherit from a mono behavior as default, whereas here you can inherit from whatever, um, well, you can basically inherit from any node within Godot. So this is default, it's a rigid body 3D. There's a bunch of other things here, such as like a, a template. So if you had some templates here that you wanted to use, you can have them uh, here. I'm not gonna do any of that. I'm just gonna leave it as sphere.gd, which is the name of the script. And then I'm gonna press create. And you can see here, that this is one of the best parts of the Godot editor, in my opinion. We have a completely integrated IDE, which means you don't have to install you know, Visual Studio Code, you don't have to install Rider or whatever other um, IDE you typically use with, with Unity. Everything is right here within the editor for you. This includes your output log, which is you can see at the bottom here. You've got your debugger, and you've got a whole bunch of things here, such as the profiler and a bunch of other stuff that I won't go into right now. But everything is in the one window, and I just think this is fantastic. So now we have our script open. Before I dive into any of the GD script stuff, and I'm not going to cover a boatload of GD scripts in this video, I just want to highlight a few little things. Before I do any of that, though, I'm going to dive back into the 3D view here. And you can see now that we have this script icon next to our node. This indicates that we have a script attached to this node. What I want to do is I want to add a printout to the, to the console here whenever this ball collides with something. Now, this brings me over to the node panel on the right hand side here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a sphere on the left here. And you can see here that we have what's called signals. Groups are a, a separate thing. We can basically add, um, we can add nodes to individual groups. That's kind of like tagging them uh, within Unity. But signals is the main thing I want to focus on here. This is where we have, for example, in Unity, you would have on collision or on trigger. This is kind of where we find those things in Godot. Now you can either hook these up programmatically within GD script itself, or you can come over to the node panel and the signals section here, and you can select one of them and that allows you to add some script to it. So for example, let's choose body entered, which is whenever uh, you can see it says emitted when a collision with another physics body occurs. I'm gonna double click on it. And it's going to say, OK, connect it to a script. Which script do you want to connect it to? I'm going to choose the sphere because this is where the script is. And it's going to ask me what the receiver method is. It's going to default it to a, a sensible name on body entered. And I'm going to press connect. And that's going to create a new function for me here called on body connect, which has a parameter of body, which is going to be the other body that collided with this. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to call print which is basically the same as debug.writeLine, I'm going to call print body.name. And now whenever the sphere collides with another object, i.e. the ground, we should hopefully see down here in the output um, that it collided with that by, by printing out the name. So let's click play. And you'll see there's an issue here. Now, this is not going to report anything in the output as we expected. Now, there's a particular reason for this, and this is because on the right hand side here in this inspector for the physics, uh, sorry, for the rigid body 3D itself, we need to enable contact monitor. Now, you can see this says, if true, the rigid body 3D will emit signals when it collides with another body. The other thing we need to do is change the max contacts reported number. Um, we're going to give this a value of one just because we want, um, you know, we only want to report a contact with one thing at a time. And now if we press play, we should see in the output here that all four of the balls contacted the ground. It's going to spam that because they're obviously bouncing. So each time it hits, it's going to output that. But you can see now that we have connected a signal on our node here. We, we connected the body entered signal and we have printed out the name of the body. Now we could have also done that by connecting the signal itself. We could have typed in connect body entered and then we could have gave it the name of the function. So we could have said on body entered just like that. And that would have done the exact same thing. Now, if I come over to this signal here, I right click and disconnect that signal. And now I get rid of this pass call here and press play. It's gonna do the same thing. You can see we're, we're still printing it out here. So you can do it programmatically or you can do it in the, um, in the sidebar here as well. 
Now, before I go any further, I just want to call out a couple of things in GDScript itself, just in regards to how they relate to Unity. So in Unity, you have uh, inside a mono behavior, you have the start function. This is the equivalent of the underscore ready function in Godot. You have the update function in Unity. That is the underscore process function here, which takes a delta, which is basically the time dot delta time in Unity. It's how much time has passed uh, since the previous frame. And if you wanted to use, for example, the fixed update function in Unity, here you can have the underscore physics process. And you can see it's telling me there um, that it already exists. You can have the physics process. And that also takes the time delta time. Now, this pass keyword here is basically just telling us that we haven't, um, you know, it's it's a way to have the function referenced here um, without any actual uh, body in it because GDScript is a tab-based language. If we had uh, nothing underneath here, this would throw an error. Now, there's another thing that is um, beneficial about the integrated development environment here. It's constantly checking your code to see if there are any errors, and it will give you this massive red highlight here, and it'll tell you right at the bottom what the actual error is. You can see it says expected indented block after function declaration. So like I say, if you just don't want to add any code to that, you can either straight up delete the function, or you can add this pass keyword in here, and that will fix that issue. So now one thing I would like to do, let's come back to our 3D scene. I'd like to have a cube in our scene that animates across, just going back and forward, um, just to demonstrate how we can use the animation player within Godot, just like we can use the timeline functionality in Unity. So I'm gonna get rid of all of these spheres. Let's just highlight these, let's delete them. Let's delete this one as well. And we'll, we'll keep the ground, it doesn't really matter. Now I'm gonna add a new child. And this time it's going to be just, let's just have a mesh instance. I don't need it to collide with anything. I'm going to call it cube. And I'm going to come into our inspector here on the right hand side. I'm going to give it a box mesh. And you won't be able to see it because it's actually inside our ground here. So let's bring that up a little bit. Make sure we can see it from our camera by clicking on the preview on the camera. Now this depth of field is slightly frustrating. So I'm going to come back into our camera attributes and disable it for now. And yeah, let's uh, let's move the camera up slightly and we'll rotate it. I'm just using the keyboard shortcuts here, which are Q, W, E, and R. I'm gonna use E for rotate. And I'm gonna just angle that down just a little bit just so that we've got a better view of the cube there. Okay, so if I wanna animate this cube across the screen, obviously there's multiple ways I can do this. I could attach a script to this cube and you know move its transform position, but I wanna do this with an animator. So I'm going to add a new child here to our scene, and I'm going to add the animation player. This is basically similar to Unity's timeline. You can see down here at the bottom now, we have this animation tab open. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this animation button. I'm going to press new, and I'm going to give it a new name. So I'm going to call it cube, let's just say cube loop. And now we get this track, very, very similar to the timeline feature. and we're going to need to animate some property. This this can this animation player lets us animate any property that we want across our entire scene. Um, I'm going to animate specifically the cube's transform position. So let's open this up here. And what I'm going to do with the with the timeline tracker here, just set all the way back to zero. And in fact, what we can do is we can change the zoom level here just to make sure that we've got a, a bit more visibility of this track. It lasts for one second, which can be changed here on the right hand side, but one second is good enough for now. I'm gonna click on the little key icon in the inspector just next to the cube's transform position. Let's press that and it's gonna say, okay, do you wanna create a new track property for the position and insert the key? I'm gonna say, yes, I do. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to move the track head all the way to the end and I'm gonna move the cube in the world. Let's say, let's move it to here. And I'm gonna press this key icon again, just to add another keyframe. Now there's two things here. One, I want this to autoplay as soon as the scene loads. And two, I want this to loop in such a way that it actually goes back and forward. I don't wanna to have to animate the, the reverse of this. I want it to do that automatically. We can do that really easily by clicking the Little A with the arrow symbol here for autoplay. That's gonna make sure that it plays as soon as we load our scene. And this little sort of loop icon here, I'm gonna click it once. That would make it loop. 
And if I click it again, it's going to make it loop, but it's in this sort of ping pong mode here now. So let me just press play on the scene here. And you'll see that our cube is now animating across and it's going to do that infinitely because we've got that ping pong loop going on and we didn't have to write any code to get that to animate. So that's the animation player in Godot. Again, very similar to the Unity timeline. And we can add any number of animations to this. We can add a new animation here. We could do sort of, you know, we could have a, a cube bouncing. We could move the ground. We could move the character or the camera. We could do anything we wanted here and we could create several different animations. Now these can all be called via functions on the animation player itself. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to stop this from autoplaying and I'd like to add a script to our, to our scene, which allows us to press a button on our keyboard and then the animation will begin to play. So there's a few different things I need to do here. The first is I'm going to come up to project, project settings. Now this is where you'll find all of the project settings for your project. For example, what its name is, what the window size is. Let's actually just change that to 1920 by 1080. So we have a nice uh, full HD window there. And basically anything you can find in the Unity project settings, such as rendering, render layer names, bunch of other things like that, you will find them here in project settings. But what we're interested in right now is the input map, which is the equivalent of the Unity Input Manager, which allows you to add different bindings for different keys to various actions within your game. I'm going to add an action here. I'm just going to call it Activate. I'm going to press the Add button. And you can see here now that we have this under our action list. And I'm going to click the plus, our, uh, so the plus symbol here for adding a um, you know, whatever key binding we want to add this to. And I'm just going to press the space bar on my keyboard and that's going to automatically detect that I press the space and I'm going to press OK. Now, one thing to note here when you're adding inputs in Godot, unlike Unity where you would add, for example, a um, let's say a joypad left stick axis and you would receive a negative one or a one value, here you you would add individual actions. So you would add, for example, a walk left and a walk right action. And for the left, you would add perhaps the joypad axis. Let's say we want the, I don't know, let's say we want the left stick, but we want the left stick left. And for the right one, we want the joypad axis left stick right. So it's kind of different. Um, it's, not, it's not too much of an issue because there's ways and means around getting the value as negative one and one. Um, with, with the input in code, um, but it's just something to bear in mind that you actually need to add the individual values for the axes separately. We're not going to use that in, in this video, but it's just something to, to bear in mind. So now we have an activate action and it's bound to our space key on our keyboard. I'm going to close this and I'm going to add a script. Now in Unity, you would probably have a game manager of some sort that has, you know, some global state or can react to, uh, you know, perhaps a inventory button being pressed on the keyboard, for example, you could add that as a top level manager in Unity. I'm just going to add this script anywhere I like. I'm going to add it to the to the world. I'm just going to press create here. I don't really care what it's called. And I want to check for whenever that activate button is being pressed. Now, I want to make sure I'm checking that every frame. So I'm going to do that inside the process function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if input input without a capital N is action just press. Now it's very verbose, but it does what it says on the tin. Has this action just been pressed this frame? And you can see here, it gives us some helpful auto completions for the actions that we have available. These ones here are built in actions. We're going to use the activate one that we specified just before. And now again, I'm not going through all of the, um, the nuances of GD script here, but we end this if statement with a, with a colon. And now what I'm going to do is I need access to our animation player. In Unity, what you would do is you would, you know, create a serialized field and you would then drag and drop the animation player or whatever game object it happens to be um, directly into that via the inspector. We can do that here as well. So let me just add a pass to this if statement for now. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the at export keyword, which is effectively the same as um, for all intents and purposes, the same as the serialized field attribute within um, Unity. I'm going to say export var, and let's call it animation player path, because this is basically going to be the path to the animation player. And I'm going to give it a, a type. I'm going to give a type in here, and you can do that by 
um, adding a colon and then specifying the type that you want it to be. And I want it to be a node path. And if I press save here, and now I come over to this world object on the left, you can see here that now on the right, I've exposed this to the inspector, just like you would with a serializable field. I'm going to press assign, and I'm going to choose our animation player. And that's now assigned the actual path to this node. It's not the actual node itself, it's the path to this node has been assigned to this variable. Now, if I want to get the actual node itself, what I can do is I can use the onReady keyword, which is effectively the same as initializing a variable from the ready function, except you don't, um, you know, it's just basically bypassing a step. I could, I could do the same thing here by um, initializing the, the value inside the ready function, but I'm going to use the onReady keyword. I'm going to say onReady var animation player equals, and I'm going to say get underscore node, that's a global function, and here it would take a, um, it, it basically expects a path to a node. Now because we've already got the path to the animation player node here called animation player path, I'm going to copy that value in, and I'm going to save that. And now that gives us access to this animation player. Inside our if statement then, I'm going to say animation player dot play, and I'm going to give it the um, the name of our the name of our animation here, which is cube, I believe cube underscore loop. So animation player dot play cube underscore loop. Okay, let's save that. And now if I press play, you see the cube isn't animating. I press space on my keyboard and the animation begins to play. Now one thing you will potentially have noticed there is that when I did animation player dot I didn't see the autocomplete for play. In fact, it doesn't actually know what kind of node this animation player is. It doesn't actually know what it is at all. So I'm going to give it a little type hint here, and I'm going to give it a animation player type hint just by um, adding that colon and then the name of the type. And now if I come down to here and type play, you can see I have all of the, the functions that are relevant to an animation player. And if I add my little things here, you know, it gets given me all of the autocomplete here as well, which is super handy. Now there's one last thing I want to show you, which is arguably the best and worst thing that Unity developers do on a daily basis, and that is singletons. And Godot has the same concept, except here they're called autoloads. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a script and in true Unity fashion, I'm going to call this script the Game Manager. And I'm going to I'm going to come in here. I'm going to delete all of the code here, and I'm just going to add one function here. So let's say func, and I'm going to call it greeting. Now, one thing I will say, naming convention wise, and this isn't super important, but it's just a convention that I like to follow, is that for functions that you don't expect to be called externally, private functions, you typically add an underscore. You'll see all of the built-in Godot functions are prefixed with an underscore. But for public functions, you just ditch that. You don't do that at all. Um, so I'm going to add a function here called greeting. And all I want to do is effectively a debug write line, except here in Godot, it's print. And I'm going to say, welcome to Godot. I'm going to save that. And now if I want to access this from, let's say, our world script here, let's, let's, let's try and call it here. Let's say game manager dot greeting. And you can see here that it doesn't it doesn't have a clue what this is. It's come up with an error. It says identify a game manager has not been declared in the current scope. So to fix that, what we're going to do, let's add that pass keyword back in there real quick. We're going to come up to our project project settings and we're going to come to the auto load tab. Now I'm going to click this little folder icon here and choose the script that I want to be auto auto loaded, which is the game manager. And I'm going to press add. And you can see here, it's given it the name Game Manager. It's figured that out based on the file name. And it's enabled the global variable. If you don't want it to be a global variable, you can untick this. But if you want it to be this sort of global um, singleton, if you like, then we can enable this global variable. Now I'm going to press close. And now anywhere I want to access that Game Manager, I can just type Game Manager dot. And you can see here now that I have access to its greeting function. I'm going to save that. This is going to call whenever the node is ready, basically the start function in Unity. I'm going to press play. And now down in our output, you can see it says, welcome to Godot.
I hope you found this video helpful, and hopefully this helps ease some of the pressure some of you may be feeling about the daunting task of moving to a new game engine. Please let me know down in the comments if you did find this useful. Also, as I mentioned at the start, if you want to ask me any questions directly, you can now become a Code with Tom member here on YouTube, where you'll gain exclusive access to my private Discord Q&A channel. Personally, I think Godot is a fantastic and powerful game engine, with an incredible community surrounding it. And given the recent influx of developers coming over to the engine, I can only imagine that it will continue to grow from strength to strength from here on out. If you're interested in learning more about Godot, I have a bunch of tutorials already available here on the channel, but I'm in the process of working on a multi-part series detailing how to create a first-person shooter in Godot 4. This will differ to my previous FPS series for Godot 3, as I'm planning to use it as an opportunity to work on my dream game, a sci-fi themed first-person shooter that borrows concepts and themes from games such as Elite Dangerous, The Longest Journey, and of course, Starfield. The series will be available for free as a relatively unfiltered set of videos here on the channel, and Code with Tom members will get exclusive access to all of the source code for the game as each new episode releases. This source code will have a fully permissive license, allowing my members to go and create their own awesome games with it as they see fit. So if this is something you're interested in, consider becoming a Code with Tom member today by hitting the join button below this video. Please remember to come and join the Discord as well, the link is in the description below. Sign up to my weekly game dev newsletter at codewithtom.com and follow me over on Twitter to stay up to date with all of my latest news. That said, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.